Hi guys, welcome back for episode number 63 of the weekly playback. Um, I only played three games in the last week, but they were all new to me, so that was good. Um, uh, someone mentioned that in the last video it seemed like it was in 360p. I'm not really sure what that even means. <laughs> Whatever that means, it was not intentional, so if the video quality was bad, I don't know if that was like a fault of YouTube or something I did on my own. I. I really don't know. I will try to become more technologically adept and figure out what I'm doing. But anyway, um, so um, so I guess I'll just talk about the games that I played. Um, so the first one I played was Encyclopedia. So I mentioned a couple of videos ago that um, Holy Grail Games went bankrupt. And so I purchased this from Amazon because I was worried that people would jack up their prices for any Holy Grail games games uh, since they went bankrupt and I wasn't sure if any other publisher would like buy the rights to any of their games. So I purchased this from Amazon just in case. Um, I actually liked it. So, um, so it is a 2022 game for one to four players designed by Eric Debu and Olivier, Olivier Melisson and um, the art is done by three different people and again published by Holy Grail Games. Um, so this is a set collection and worker placement with dice game. So I will show you the components. So the play, actually let me just take this out first. So this is the board. Okay, maybe I'll just put a picture of this up there. Okay, so in this area you're going to have some cards which are like kind of like cards that may give you an extra ability during the game or end of game scoring abilities. Um, this is just going to be the round tracker and you might get like a certain like gift or whatever at the beginning of the round. Um, this is where you're going to have all your animal cards. Here you are going to be placing dice to perform this action. I'll talk about the different actions. And then here you're going to be placing cubes. So I'll talk about how that works. And here you can go up here if you want to get some of these exploration tokens, or I think those are what those are called. And here you can go if you need some money. So there's different areas of the board in which you're going to be placing dice. And then each person has their own player board. Um, and the player board will, this, this is really meaningless, like which character you're playing, like it has no impact on the game. So, um, I mean, they could have honestly just made four different player boards with just four different characters, but I guess they wanted variety, but really makes no difference. You're going to be placing those cards that give you the end of game scoring abilities or special actions you have over here. This is a reputation tracker, which is really not that hard to earn in this game. Like reputation, you can come by pretty easily. And anytime your reputation marker passes over one of those things or lands on one of those things, you'll get that bonus. Um, and you're going to, at the beginning of each round, you will have, oh, and this also uh, is like kind of like a little aid that like is at the end of your whichever side um, of your player board. So there's going to be d dice of different colors. And so the colors matter for the different animal cards. Um, in some parts of the board, the colors matter. In other parts of the board, they do not really matter, if I remember correctly. Um, so each person starting with the first player is going to draw like four dice. I think it's four. And then you're going to place them at the top of your board. On your turn, you can take either a die from your own board or a die from your opponent's board to use and then place it somewhere on the main board to take an action. So if you take a die from your opponent's board, like one of the other players, if you take it from one of those three spots, then they'll get that bonus that is associated with it. So they may get three points, they might get to go up two spaces on the reputation track, or they might get two coins. And then you're going to take various actions on the main board. So again, the various actions are to either get some of these tokens, exploration tokens, that can allow you to no, change the color of um, 
It, I think it may even allow you to increase the value of some pips, but I do think it definitely changes the color if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, so you can do that. You can go to the, oh, so they're called expedition tokens. That's what they're called. You can go and uh, place a die in the uh, embassy to get expedition tokens, depending on the value of your die. You can go to the bank to get five coins. You can go to the university to gain an expert card of your choice. And it's those cards that I mentioned earlier that give you like either an ability or end of game scoring um, ability. And the colors do matter. They can come into play during the uh, end of the game for set collection points as well. So like here is an example of some set, um, ex uh, expert cards. You can go to the academy to gain an animal card of your choice. So of course those are the most important part of the game. So let me just show you some animal cards. And each animal card is going to have four different spots on the bottom. Like, so there's going, each animal is associated with a certain con continent, uh, a certain diet type. So like either um, herbivore or carnivore, it's associated with like um, a certain landscape and then a climate. So there's going to be different kinds of icons that you'll see at the bottom of these animal cards. So like here's another example. So again, continent, like different kinds of landscape type, like water or grasslands, whatever, different kinds of diet types and then weather types. So, and then of course animals, um, sorry, uh, the first circle was not continent, I believe it's the top part that indicates continent, um, which is the color. I don't, yeah. Sorry, it's the top part that indicates the color. That I think indicates like whether it's like a bird or a mammal or whatever. Um, so yeah. So those are the different animal cards. And again, over there, the color does matter. And I don't think the pip at that point matters. The pips only in the um, uh, Academy, they will allow you to gain reputation when you pick up an animal card. Um, you can go to the expedition area. So when you go to an expedition area, that is where the pips really matter. And that is when you will be able to place cubes on the animal cards. And you want to try to place as many cubes as possible on the same kind of symbols between the different animal cards you have. As far as I remember, there's no limit on the number of animal cards you can have below your board. Um, there are, keep in mind, there's only six rounds, I believe, in this game. And um, let me just double check this board. I believe it's six rounds. Yeah, six rounds. Um, so the objective of the game is to try to get cubes on those cards and then you want to publish, you want to perform a publication. So if you go to the bottom part of the board, the very bottom part, that's where you can publish. So again, um, there the uh, die color must be the same as the reference animal. So basically you're going around this board, you're trying to collect like expedition tokens in case you want to change the color of a die somewhere. You, you know, those are easier to come by those, so you probably won't go to the embassy that often. Often you are trying to change the value of the pips on the die dice um, so that you can get the different, you know, things that you need to do. However, it's really, you know, placing cubes on these cards and then publishing that is really where all the points come in. Like there's really, you know, not many other paths to like getting points in this game. So when you publish, you are going to select one of your animal cards as the reference card and the die that you place on your reference card must be of the same color as the card that you are placing it on. So let's suppose I placed a die on this, um, I don't know what this animal is. Let me pick, let me pick this dolphin. So let's a porpoise or whatever this is. Let's play, let's suppose I put a blue die on this porpoise. The only um, categories I can publish in are the ones that are shown on this card. So if I have other animals that have those categories, so it looks like an elephant, it looks like a meat and water and then snow. So let's suppose I picked, let's suppose I had like this. So let's suppose these were I mean, obviously you're not gonna publish unless you have a lot of cards, but like, let's suppose these were the three cards I had at that point in time with dice on them and sorry, with cubes on them in like all the various slots. Um, if there is not the same category on this card, but you decide to 
move these cubes over into the publication area of the board so that you can get points. This card will get turned upside down and will become help you to get set collection points at the end of the game. But these two that you also used to publish in whichever categories matched up with this one, you'll remove those cubes. And then if there were categories that did not match up with this one and you had cubes on them, those cubes go to waste basically and they come back to you. And these cards then go to discard after you've moved your cubes over to the publication area on the board, which will give you immediate points, but then also at the end of the game you'll get set collection points based on the number of cubes you have in each area of the publication section of the board. So and when you place cubes on them you'll also get points. So when you perform an expedition and you place cubes on them to begin with it's um, the higher value cube that you want to place, the more pips you're going to need on your dice. Um, so performing expeditions is a little bit harder in this game than any other part of the game but um, if you can get those higher points, that's one way to get points. But then you want to try to have cards that have like a majority of the same symbols because when you publish and you remove the cubes from the cards, if the cards are of different continents, then those will get discarded. Only the ones that match the continent of your reference one on which you place the cube so that you can publish will get turned upside down and count towards end of game set collection points. So you are really trying to go for cards that belong to the same continent, but also have the same symbols on the bottom. So really it's like not there's like really no variety in this game because you're really just trying to get what you need and there's like really no other paths to victory in this game. So I mean if you're okay with that then I think you will enjoy this game. Um, I can foresee it getting you know like a bit stale after a couple of plays like after a couple of plays you might be like yeah I've had my fill of this game because like really there's really not much else to do in it right so really you're just trying to get cards with the same categories on them of the same colors hopefully so that you can publish and get mega points and flip over those cards so that, that you can get more set collection points from them at the end of the game as well so again really there isn't you know much else going on in this game. So I was, you know, I um, watched several videos from different content creators on this game and people were like going on and on about like how this game was just so amazing and blah blah blah. And I guess maybe because of all the videos I watched, like my expectations were really high. <laughs> um, so I thought it was a good game. I wouldn't say that it was like the most amazing game. Um, but yeah, it's a good game and if you like animals, you will like it, I think, because the artwork is really beautiful. I love the different um, animal art in the cards. It's a, you know, if you like dice worker placement games, you might enjoy it. Um, but I do think it might become a little bit samey and a little bit boring after a couple of plays for some people. So it's a game I would um, probably keep in my collection, just not play like you know, several times in a row, like I might play it and then pull it out again after a couple of months so that it doesn't feel old and samey samey to me. Because again, there's really not many paths to victory in this game, so you might just kind of get bored of it um, if you play it too often, I think. So yeah, but otherwise I enjoyed it for what it is. Um, but yeah, I just, uh, I do not think it's as amazing as a lot of people were saying it is. Um, so yeah, <laughs> so I don't know, um, but yeah, it's a good game. Do I regret spending money on it? I don't know. Um, probably not. I do think I sp it's probably, I, you know, I probably would not want to spend as much as I did on it. I paid the Amazon price, which I think was like $55. Um, do I think it's a $55 game? Mm, probably not, but you know, if I can get a a couple of good plays out of it. I think it might have been worth it because, you know, again, this publisher is out of print, um, out of business now, they're bankrupt now. So who knows if, you know, um, at least I satisfied my FOMO, I guess that's it. <laughs> you know, I satisfied my fear of missing out because this publisher has gone bankrupt and, you know, there could be the, you know, that feeling of like, oh my God, I need a game by this publisher because now they're, you know, bankrupt and who knows if their games will ever be published again. So for that reason, it'll probably stay in my collection. But I, you know, I, again, I don't think it's like the most amazing game out there. And if you like dice work or placement games or games with animals, there's probably better games out there than Encyclopedia. But you know, it's a good game. Um, 
it's a good family weight game too, I think, like a good medium weight uh, game if you're interested in that. All right, the next game I played is Nico Demas. So I bought this um, from Board Game Bliss. I am a huge fan of Imaginarium, and this is like the two player version of Imaginarium. So this came out in 2021. It's for two players, designed by Bruno Catala and Florian Sirix. And the artwork is done by hmm, Feli Diaz Bubestis. Well, I don't know. And it's published by Bombix Games. <laughs> so, so if you've played Imaginarium, um, it may remind you a bit of Imaginarium, but it's of course a much more like simplified version because it's a two player game, a two player only game. So, you know, there are action points and contracts and like hand management going on in this game. So you are going to have this one board and you are going to have a stack of cards like here and cards will come out like different um, machine cards and there's going to be actually this is the top of the board and the discard pile is here and you are going to start placing cards like when you place a card on your turn um, i believe what the game starts with one card already out here but you're going to place them on the top row and then start on the bottom row but if you're repairing a machine you are going to start by selecting cards from the bottom right and then for each machine part you pass over, if you don't want to repair, you'll have to place a tarcolium on a card for each card you pass over. If at any point in time both rows get filled, then you discard all the cards in the top row and push all the cards from the bottom row up to the top and so on. So basically you are going to have these different cards. So it comes with like this little um, so it's, like I said, it's a two player game, so pretty basic. So there are these machine parts and like Imaginarium, there's like, you know, different kinds of cards. Um, so, and you know, like Imaginarium, the artwork is like very like steampunk-esque. And you know, um, I think the artwork in Imaginarium is better though. So there are different kinds of machines. So there's a few different colors. I believe there's four colors in total. And there are these project tiles that will, there's gonna be a couple of project tiles placed above the board. I believe six in total. So you'll see these slots. Like, yeah, so you'll see like these slots here. So you're going to have some randomly selected project tiles placed there. And those are like objectives that you can try to achieve throughout the game by the machines that you repair. So each machine will have a special ability it's going to have the points that it's worth, the production, like what resource it produces, and then the resources needed to repair it. So you are on your turn, you're either placing a machine onto the belt or whatever it's called. I don't remember what the term is. Let me just double check the term. Um, bric-a-brac. So you're either placing a machine onto the bric-a-brac and um, you can, from your hand. So your hand will always have, I believe, six cards in hand. So you will always have six cards, unless of course someone, because it is possible for your opponent to steal a card from you, and then you may have five cards on your turn when you go, but you'll be able to draw back up to six um, at the end of your turn. So you will either place a machine on the bric-a-brac and then, so you will place a machine, either place a machine or repair a machine. If you place a machine, then you have three choices. You can either earn as many charcoalium as the victory point value of the machine you just placed, charcoalium you need for when you do the repair action. If you want to skip over certain machines, uh, you'll need to place a charcoalium in each machine that you skip over um, when you decide which one you want to repair. Or you can produce one resource or charcoalium according to what is shown on the machine's production zone. So like for example, this machine produces copper. So if you decided to do that, you would pick up one copper or you can apply the effect of the machine. So again, all these different machines have a different effect. Um, but of course, like both of these, they're the same type. So they're going to have the same effect. So the same kind of machine will have the same effect, but if it's a different kind of machine, then it'll have a different effect. So the effects can like, you know, allow you to like maybe collect more resources. It can allow you to maybe steal a resource from your opponent. It can make your opponent maybe discard some resources. There's like different kinds of effects going on with the cards. You can maybe like even like discard cards from the bric-a-brac. So there's different kinds of effects from these cards that you can apply. So when, if you decide to place a machine card, 
card, you can either, again, collect charcoalium, take the resource indicated on the card, or apply the effect of the card. Or you can repair a machine. And when you repair a machine, you need to turn in the amount of resources indicated here. However, if you had previously repaired a machine and you have it in your workshop, you will have a discount of the resource shown on the machine in your workshop that can be applied to repairing new machines. However, you can only have... so. If you have already repaired three machines and you just repaired a fourth machine, the first three will be mandatorily discarded. So, you know, there are certain objective tiles, these project tiles that you need to be mindful of. So like, for example, this one requires you to have a machine in each of the four colors. So it requires you to have a machine in your workshop that is yellow, green, red, and purple. So I had the situation where I had three machines in my workshop and I was trying to go for this project tile, which would have given me five immediate points if I completed this on my turn, but I accidentally uh, repaired a machine of one of the same colors as before, so I could not complete this. And it also, because it was my fourth machine that I was repairing, it required me to discard, the not discard, but like push aside, basically discard the first three machines. Um, so I lost the... Um, the resources from those three machines, of course, and I also did not complete an objective. So when you also complete a project tile, these are optional. It's like on your turn after you complete a uh, repair a machine um, action, you can complete one of these objectives and it's optional. You don't have to do it, but there are certain rules. Like, so you, for example, if you repaired your second machine that was red and you have two machines in your workshop that are now red, uh, if you decide not to complete this project tile, if you want to complete this on your next turn, you can't use two machines that are previously there that are red, and let's suppose that the third machine you repaired is blue, you would not be able to complete this then. The, I believe that's the rule. So I think when you complete a project tile, it has to be with a current machine that you just repaired that fulfills the objective. If I remember correctly, there's something tricky about that. Um, but again, if you complete a fourth repair, then the first three get discarded. Um, so the game end trigger is once someone reaches 20 points or the uh, machine deck runs out, I believe, um, the card deck runs out, something like that. So again, you can get like points from these project tiles by immediately completing them. And of course, anytime you repair a machine and it goes into your workshop, you'll get points. So it's a bit similar to Imaginarian, but of course a much more simpler version of it since it's a two player game. But you know, I thought it was a good two player game. I enjoyed it. Um, I do think I still prefer the original Imaginarium. I do think that there will be a little bit of variability in this because there are more project tiles than you use. Um, there are certain abilities on cards that will allow you to even have your own project tiles in your own workshop that only you can complete and no one else can complete. Um, and again, I do like the artwork in the original game better. Um, but yeah, um, it's a nice little two-player game. So, you know, if you're looking for a two-player game that you can just pull out and play that, you know, doesn't require as much brain power as maybe some other two-player games, then I would recommend Nico Demas. And as, again, you know, I like the artwork, but the artwork in the original I think is better. But if you enjoy like that kind of steampunk artwork, then I think you will enjoy it. And finally, the last game I played, I don't own, but I would very much like to add it to my collection because I thought it was so freaking good and I cannot believe it took me this long to play it, and that is Mandala. So I played Mandala, which is a 2019 game for two players, and it is designed by Trevor Benjamin and Brett Gilbert, and the art is done by Clemens Franz, and it's published by Lookout Games. So in Mandala, you're going to have like these two circles, like mandalas, and there's a part of the mandala that's called the mountain, which is the center of each mandala. So you're going to have like this cloth between you and your opponent. And on each side, there's going to be the field area that each person will have where they can place cards on their side, on the other side of the mountain, on their side of the board of the cloth. And then you're going to have this bottom part, which I believe is called the river. <coughs> and the river has six slots. Um, 
And then at the end of the river, you're going to have your cup. And what's in your cup is what's going to be scored. So the beginning of the game starts out with two cards face up in each mountain of the mandala, of each mandala. Again, there's two. And then you're going to have two cards face down in your cup. And then you will have cards in your hand. And I believe you always have five cards in hand at a time. So on your turn, you can either place one card into the mandala the mountain and it has to be a color that is uh, different than that is already there or if a, if the color is already there you just add on top of it however if you want to add a card to your field it has to be a different color than what's in the mountain or the other person's field um, so there are six colors in total and a mandala is completed when it has all six colors, which is from the mountain, the other person's field, and your field. And then when a mandala is scored, what's going to happen, so you can have more multiple cards of the same color in your side of the field, and you can place multiple cards down at one time on your side of the field. So like, for example, if there was like, say a blue, I don't remember the exact color, so I could be off with the colors, but let's suppose there was a blue and an orange in the mountain of the mandala and I had like four purples in my hand I could place all four purples down on my field um, but when you place cards in your field you cannot draw back up you can only draw back up if you place cards into the mountain so if there's a blue and an orange in the mountain and I have blues and oranges in my hand you can only place one card at a time in the mountain so I could place one blue on top of the already existing blue and then draw up to three cards from the draw deck until I reach my hand limit oh sorry the hand limit is eight cards now I remember the, the limit is eight cards so you can draw up to eight cards um, so if you previously lost a lot of cards by placing them into the field you can draw back up until you have eight cards in your hand but only three of course if you place a card into the mountain um, so when a mandala has all six cards so that again includes the mountain and the other players field and your field you score so the person who has the most cards in their field will get to select from the mountain first <coughs> if there's a tie then it's the person who did not place most recently so if there's a tie um, god there's something in my throat it's like feeling ticklish um, it's the person who did not, did not place most recently. But again, it's the person who has the most cards in their field. So then you will select one of the colors from the mountain. And if you have an open slot in your river, it's gonna go, one of those cards will go in the leftmost slot that's available in your river, and they have point values associated with them. And then the other cards will go upside down in your cup. So basically you are filling up your river with different cards of the six different colors and they have point values associated with them. The far left is going to have the lowest point value. The far right is going to have the highest point value. The game end does trigger once someone either completes like their river. So they've placed down the sixth card in their river or I believe like the deck runs out or something like that. There's another game end trigger. Um, <coughs> I think it's likely that you will <coughs> trigger the game end by placing a sixth card in the river. So it's a tricky game because you are trying to collect as many cards in your cup of the higher point value color that you have. And you know, again, when you win cards, you place one into a river if you already don't have that existing color. <coughs> If you already do have that color in your river, then those cards that you collect from the mountain will then all just go in your cup upside down. So I got to the point where I had five cards in my river and I just needed purple. Purple was the last card I needed to complete my river. My opponent at that point in time only had two cards in his river. Um, so at this point in time, he didn't want the game to end. So he was trying to collect as many of the purple cards as he could and you know, he was essentially trying to prolong the game because he knew if I got that last purple card, it would end the game. So it's a really cool, interesting game in that like you kind of have to pay attention to what the other person's river has, which is visible to you. You can see which cards are in their river and which 
cards will be worth more points for them based on the color and where they're located in the river. Of course, you can't see what's in their cup because those are upside down, but you can kind of pay attention throughout the game. And if you have a good memory, you might remember, oh, they picked up like six orange cards from this mountain and orange is worth three points for them. So six times three, that's already 18 points that they have. So, you know, you can kind of pay attention to things like that. Um, so my opponent ended up ending the game before I got my sixth card in my river. So I did not score six points for any cards, but I still won um, because I managed to collect a lot of cards in my cup that were of higher, the higher point value in my river that I had. It is a really cool game. I really enjoyed it. So if you are looking for like a really strategic, like very interesting, like set collection hand management game, definitely check out Mandala. I cannot believe it took me this long to play this game. I just did not know how good it was, but I really, really loved it. It was so good. Yeah, so definitely check out Mandala if you're looking for a really good like abstract strategy two-player game. Highly recommend. It's a game I definitely want to add to my collection, but it's, it's a bit pricey for the small box that it is. Like Amazon has it for like $30 right now. I think my friend, he picked it up as a deal of the day for like 10 bucks, and now I kind of wish I'd done that too, but I shall wait until it goes down in price someday. So those are the games that I played in the last week. So let's move on to games that I am backing. So I am backing still a couple games that I talked about in the previous, but I'll just talk about a new one. Well, first I'll talk about the games that are ending the soonest. So River Wild and Ancient Realm, that's actually ending tomorrow by the time you might be seeing this video if I have time to edit it today because I'm shooting on a Friday. But the campaign for this is ending on Saturday. So again, I really like um, button shy games. They're very portable and especially the solo ones are just great to take with you when you travel somewhere. So I'm backing River Wild and Ancient Realm. I'm backing a print and play called Pinocchio and other games. Um, so it's a print and play of like an 18 card game, I think. I think it's 18 cards. The artwork is really cool. I really like the like kind of like vintagey look to it. It looks like just a fun little game that you can just print and play. And uh, I think that they've unlocked certain stretch goals so that you'll actually get a couple other games with it as well, like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and there's some hot air balloon racing game, it looks like, which looks really cool. I really like the artwork. Like, I really, really love the looks, the look of these games. So yeah, you should definitely check out Pinocchio. It's like three euros print and play. So I'm, I'm backing that. And then again, I'm backing Tether for all the reasons I mentioned in the last video. It just like looks like a really good two-player game with really cool artwork. Um, and then Reviving Kathmandu because I really like Chili Mafia. And so uh, Reviving Kathmandu looks really interesting. So moving on, let's go on to games that I have received and or bought. So the first game I'll show, which I will need to make a video for soon, so I hope I get to play it soon, is Tolerance because this is coming out on Kickstarter next week. So it's 16th century England from Tudors to the Reformation, and it is a trick-taking game for three to some players, three to five players. So this is a trick-taking game. I heard it's really good, um, but I, um, you know, I, I don't kn actually know how it plays yet. <laughs> so, but hopefully I'll be playing it this weekend since I have to make a video of it really soon. It looks like these are some, I actually don't really know. So, but it comes with these like kind of like cards, like these big like, yeah. So, but um, let me just show you some of the cards from the game. So it's a trick-taking game that's played over like three different ages, like that have to do with like the different Tudor rulers that there were. I actually really love uh, the Tudors, the the history of the Tudors and stuff. So um, just a fun fact. <laughs> so when I was in like in elementary school and we always had to like do a biography report of someone uh, from grade to grade, like from year to year, I always chose Henry VIII just because like, you know, your new teacher wouldn't know who you did a biography report on in the year before. So I'm like, obviously I'm just going to pick the same person every year. Like, why wouldn't I do that? Because then I can just, you know, um, improve on the report I wrote in the previous year. So I always did my biography reports on Henry VIII, like every single year in elementary school when we had to do a biography, I always chose Henry VIII. So yeah. 
Um, and then of course, uh, you know, I love the TV show, The Tudors. I thought it was really good um, with Jonathan Rhys Meyers. And, you know, of course I've visited the Tower of London several times and I've been to um, that other place where he was actually born in England the name of uh, Hampton Palace, I think it's called. So yeah, so um, I'm looking forward to playing this. Um, another game that arrived recently. Um, so I guess I'll do, okay, so I'll do, uh, this is actually not an arrival, it's a game that I bought. So I traded in some games that I no longer wanted for Namiji. So Namiji is, let me just pull up the information. Namiji. So this is a 2022 game. I only played Takaido once. I really like the look of Takaido. I played it once many years ago, so I really do not remember much about it. But Namiji, I think, is uh, designed by the same designer. So this is a 2022 game for two to five players designed by Antoine Bauza. And the artwork, which I really like, is done by Xavier Guenefi. Uh, Durin and it's published by Funforge Games. Um, so this is a point-to-point -point movement set collection game and I guess with some variable player powers maybe um, but I just really love like the crisp clean look of this game like just the white with the colors that pop on the board reminds me very much of one of my all-time favorite games Petrichor like the look of it like the white with the pops of color um, here are the player boards which are just really really pretty as well So I believe that this was a game that was kickstarted. So I think you probably could get like a deluxe version. I've seen deluxe versions of this with like boats, like miniature boats. But of course, this is not a deluxe version. This is a retail edition that again, I traded in some games for. So those are the different player piece colors. And I really love the player piece colors. It's like a really beautiful aqua color, pink and like a lime green, and then like a pastel yellow. Like just seriously love these colors. Um, and then there's like these different tiles, which, you know, I, I haven't played yet, so I don't, I don't know how it plays, but like just different like tiles. Um, what's in here? Oh, different crustacean tokens. So like shrimp and I guess lobster maybe, or crab. Yeah, different little crustacean tokens. And then, uh oh, there we go. Um, and the cards, the cards are really, really pretty, so. So let me just see if they're, I don't think that they're all in the same order, but same direction. But like, I just really love like the artwork on these cards, like just really, really love it. Um, so yeah, it looks like there may be some set, like some um, um, like thing where you have to like put certain things together to like make a whole set. Like, so these like, co like uh, connect these cards if you get them to form like one whole image. So it has those. Um, so yeah, so I think that's about it in here. But again, you know, I haven't played this, so I currently do not know how it plays, but I hope I can actually play it tonight. I'm supposed to play a board game tonight. Um, we haven't decided on a game yet, but maybe this one, that would be nice. So yeah, so I traded in a couple of games for Namiji and then a Kickstarter that arrived recently is Tiwanaku. So Tiwanaku is a deduction game that I had backed on Kickstarter and I backed the deluxe version. So it comes with this sleeve and then the artwork on the box is like this. And this is by Sit Down Games. <clears throat> so the interesting thing is that um, it comes with two rule books um, in the same so when you if you back this on Kickstarter um, the deluxe edition I guess I guess you were able to pick which language you wanted an additional rule book in and so I picked English and so I did not know that they would actually send an additional rule book so I have two rule books in English which I guess is pretty cool <laughs> so I guess you know two people can rule, read the rules at the same time so and then here are some player screens um, so I don't know how it plays, so I don't know what you need player screens for exactly. And then here is a player board, or the main board rather. And I think depending on whether you want to play a shorter or a longer game, you'll decide which side you want to use. And then this looks like a score track, I think. I really don't know. 
Um, and then you have this. Now the deluxe edition comes, so these are cardboard tiles. The deluxe edition wooden tiles do not fit into the insert. So I still have them in a bag. So the deluxe edition comes with a bunch of different wooden tiles. They don't fit into the insert, which kind of really sucks. Um, it has like these cute little llama score markers and then a bunch of different like so for your player color you'll have some of these like people and then it has i didn't open this yet but i think for which puzzle you want to solve you're going to insert one of these into this thing which i guess click, click, can maybe move or something like that so yeah it looks like this thing moves um again again i don't know how it plays but um it looks like something like that okay um, and then there are like these different kinds of like wooden uh, chips, whatever those are, I don't know. Um, so yeah, and then some wooden tokens as well, like of the different kinds of produce, like corn and like whatever other produce, carrots, I don't know. Um, so yeah, so this was a game I backed on Kickstarter. I do think it's a bit disappointing that the wooden tiles don't fit into the box. Um, so yeah, but oh well. Yeah, so, you know, I do wish that if they're going to offer like a deluxe edition that, you know, that they ensure everything fits into the main box for those who are backing the deluxe edition. Um, I might just try to get a nice like box to store these wooden tiles in because this box is just quite flimsy. Um, so I might just try to get some like nice storage solution for these. Um, but yeah. And it did also the different um, chips and stuff I showed you. It did come with the wooden, the cardboard components for that. Um, but I didn't punch those out, obviously. Um, so a game that I received recently, and finally I received my copy because others received theirs so long ago. So this is actually a review copy. Um, I uh, received Amsterdam and Hamburg from the Stefan Feld collection. So um, from Queen Games. So I actually haven't unboxed Hamburg yet. Um, so that's actually still downstairs. So I'm not going to show it to you today. But this is Amsterdam from the Steffenfeld collection. So this is the deluxe edition. And I really love Amsterdam. I only visited the city once, but um, I was really excited to see this game. And I don't know which uh, original Steffenfeld game this is a re like implementation of or like a new edition of because i know that amster that hamburg is a re implementation of bruges no bruges yes um, but this one i don't know if it's a entirely new game or also a new edition of some previous game that he made i wonder if bgg will say um, I'll say it is a re-implementation. So it's a re-implementation of Macau with a new setting, improved card balance, and new gameplay elements. So it also, it's a blah, blah, blah. Okay, so it's a 2022 game for one to four players, um, different artwork by different artists, including Clemens Franz, and again, published by Queen Games, and for, I think I said for one to four players. So it has a bunch of different components in it. I guess I won't show you all of them, but like, no insert, which kind of sucks. <laughs> um, but it's got a bunch of different, I think it's a pick and play or a pick and pass or what do you call it? Pick up and play or what do you call that action? Um, pick up and pass, pick up and deliver. There we go. That's the word I was looking for. Pick up and deliver. It's a pick up and deliver game. Um, like I said, I love Amsterdam and I love like the different buildings in Amsterdam. So I think you have to put together some kind of a board here. Um, and then there is, oh, there's more here. Yeah, so pretty. And then there is a main board. I really wish this game had an insert though. Um, I think these are like player boards, like maybe you have to put them together because they come in like the different player colors, I think. Um, yeah, if you ever go to Amsterdam and you want to see those like old style windmills, uh, I believe there's a place nearby, not too far from the city of Amsterdam called Zanse Shans, where you can see those old windmills. And it's a really picturesque, cute little touristy area if you want to go there. But yeah, here is the main board. So yeah, 
Um, so yeah, actually maybe I'll see if my friend wants to play this tonight because I'd be down to play this. This looks fun. Um, I don't think I have too many Steffenfeld games in my collection actually. I know I have Bruges, which I played and I liked. Um, so I may not even open up Amster uh, Hamburg since I already have Bruges. I don't know. Oh, I didn't open up the cards yet, um, but it comes with two different um, sets of cards. So lots of cards. Oh, and then it has like these tiles. Um, but yeah, uh, you know, I don't know. There's like a lot of different components to this game. Um, yeah. So yeah, and then, oh, it comes with like this wooden coin, uh, not wooden, uh, metal coin, which I don't know, is that supposed to be Steffenfeld? I don't know who that is supposed to be. Is that him? Is that what he looks like? I really don't know. It says limited challenge coin edition, coin games. And then on the back, yeah. So I don't know if that person is, I don't know if that's Steffenfeld. I think that looks like him, right? I think he looks like that. Yeah, maybe that is him actually. So yeah, so it comes with a coin, which I don't know what you're supposed to do with this. I guess you could use it for a first player marker maybe, I don't know. It comes with some nice dice. Yeah, so like a lot of components to this game. Oh, and let me actually show you some of the nicer upgraded components. Um, so if you have the deluxe edition, your little boat guys will look like this. They're screen printed. So you'll have like a little guy in a boat. And then you'll have like another like tugboat kind of thing. I think that's a tugboat or like, I don't know what they're called. Um, and then you're also going to have these like acrylic tokens. With, like these windmills on them. So these are acrylic. I don't know if you can see that. So it comes with the, this and there are some other uh, tokens that were in acrylic as well. And I don't remember where those ones are. Like the different goods uh, tokens came. Oh yeah, here we go. So there's like a bunch of different like goods and those came in these like acrylic tokens as well. So those are like the upgrades. So I think the player pieces are upgraded and then, um, you know, some of the uh, goods tokens. Not everything is upgraded, but those are like the upgraded pieces. And then if you have the deluxe edition, it comes with these metal coins, which I think you can use for all of the city collection, it appears. Um, so it comes in this box and it has like these empty slots, which I don't understand, but um, it comes with some value 10 coins. It looks like that's the highest value. And then there's a five. And again, on the back of each coin, there's just a portrait, like a, a side uh, portrait, whatever you call it, of Steffenfeld. And then there's some value threes and then some pennies value ones. So I think these can be used for all of the city collection games, I believe. So that arrived. And again, I haven't opened up Hamburg yet. It's actually sitting downstairs. Um, it came with some insert. I think that one came with an insert separately that you can put in the game, but mine's still in shrink wrap. I don't even know yet if I'm going to open it since I have Bruges and I haven't decided and I just have so many games. So maybe I'll give it away in a giveaway. I don't know. I haven't decided yet, but that's still in shrink wrap. So I'm not going to be showing that. Um, so games I'm calling, I don't have anything to add this week, but as I start unpacking more and more, I know I've moved in months ago and I really should be unpacked by now, but, <laughs> but it's like just so overwhelming. So I haven't finished yet, but as I start to finish and get there eventually, I know that I will have to call games because even though I'm living in my own house now, you would think I'd have room for all these games, but um, I did buy two Billy bookcases, which I you know, put in that closet. But despite that, like I don't have enough shelf space for all the games I own. So I really need to call stuff because just too many games. And you know, I don't think anyone really needs this many games because you cannot even play all of them within the span of two years even, unless you just play games all the time and that's all you do. So I'm definitely gonna, you know, start adding more games to the calling pile once um, I start to organize a bit more. Um, so updates, I don't really have any updates, but like if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know that Tim from SirMeeple.com, he created this like really cool comic book character of me. And so I posted the image on, 
uh, Instagram and I really, really loved it. It's totally got like Agent Carter vibes, which I really, really love. Like, and I think, you know, he did a pretty good job with my likeness and then he turned it into a shirt, which you can buy. So if you want to support my content and you want me as a superhero, like a comic book superhero, you can buy that shirt from sirmeeple.com. Um, I absolutely love it. I, you know, I guess it would be a little bit weird, maybe narcissistic for me to wear a shirt with my own likeness on it, but I just love it so much and I want to get it on something. But right now it's only on shirts and hoodies. Um, so I'll see if maybe he can put it on like mugs or like tote bags or something like that because I really want it. I just really, really love it. Maybe I will get a shirt of myself as a comic book hero. I don't know. Maybe it would be a bit weird to wear, but I don't care. I just really, really love it. So, so if you want to check it out, I'm going to leave a link below if you want to support my content and get something in return like a really cool comic book superhero uh, character me then yeah you can totally check that out and of course sir meeple has all of the amazing obsession shirts and obsession enamel pins which i'm super excited to wear so um my um duchess lilo pin i'm so excited to finally be able to wear that to a convention so speaking of convention so yeah if you want obsession stuff definitely go to sirmeeple.com and while you're there check out my merch because yeah it would totally help me out as well but yeah i love all the obsession merch over there i'm, I'm totally gonna get the board game shirt that he has as well i need to get that um, I already have like three other or four other obsession shirts. I have the Cabinet of Curiosities. I have the Ponso B shirt because I typically play as the Ponso B family when I play obsession. And then I have the, um, the cat shirt. And then I think I have one more shirt, which I cannot remember right now, but I definitely want the board game room shirt. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely want that. And I think I want another Duchess Lilo shirt just because I feel like mine is getting worn out. I've worn it so many times. So yeah, definitely check out sirmeeple.com. Let's talk about cons. So every year people ask me if I'm gonna go to Gen Con and every year I say, oh, not this year, maybe next year. I did apply for a media badge. I never heard back from them, um, but even if they approve me for a media badge, probably not gonna go because I am going to UKGE again, which is the UK Games Expo, which is, uh, the first weekend of July, no, I, sorry, June, the first weekend of June. So as you guys know, I've mentioned several times, I used to live in London like a long time ago, but um, I go back, I'd like to go back once a year if I can to visit my friends there and visit my favorite like haunts, like so my favorite restaurants, you know, I like to visit my favorite parks. I just love the feeling of being surrounded by history. Um, I just really, really love London a lot. Um, I actually enjoy visiting it more as a tourist, like going back and visiting my friends than I did when I lived there because when I lived there, I had all the like stuff that you typically have, like when you're living somewhere, like, you know, all, it was just like me living my regular life in just a really cool city, but I was just, you know, so busy with work and just like, personal stuff, personal life stuff that I didn't get to enjoy London to its fullest, I think, when I lived there. I mean, I still did enjoy it, but I, you know, I definitely enjoy it more as a tourist who doesn't have all the responsibilities of life when I visit. So I absolutely love London. It is such an amazing city and it's like one of my favorite places on earth. So, so, you know, I, um, I try to go back every year if I can to visit my friends and to visit my favorite places. And so UKGE is in Birmingham. So I um, just take a, I buy a train ticket to go there early in the morning and then come back in the evening for two days. So I will be doing UKGE again this year. So it'll be my second one. I did it for the first time last year. So I don't think I'll be at Gen Con this year. Um, yeah, just because, you know, with finances the way they are, I don't think I can afford Gen Con if I'm going to UKGE. So um, maybe next year, <laughs> so I'll just say that again, maybe next year. Um, I know that a lot of my, uh, you know, followers attend Gen Con and there's so many people who would love to meet me at Gen Con, but, you know, right now the main conventions I attend are PAX Unplugged and UKGE. So if you are gonna be at UKGE, please leave a comment below. I would love to meet up with you and just maybe even play a game with you if that's possible. So if you're gonna be there and you'd like to see me, then definitely leave a comment below. And I know it's still a few months away, but you know, it's always good to plan in things in advance. So I think those are all the updates I have. Oh, so I did actually finish a game of Obsession recently on Board Game Arena. So my question of the week relates to that actually um so last week I mentioned that I played Caverna on Board Game Arena and I did not enjoy it and I kind of had to learn the rules on Board Game Arena as well um, it was my first time ever playing the game and I found that and Obsession is a game I've played several times in person so I know the rules for it 
but I feel like when I play games on Board Game Arena, I just cannot really develop a strategy the way I can when I play them in person. Like I feel like when I play games in person and things are actually in front of me, I can really start to like envision a strategy and figure out what I want to do. Like with Obsession, I can like plan ahead. I can be like, okay, if I use this worker, you know, if I use these servants in this round and then, you know, I won't have them again for a while. And then I can plan which like gentry I want to use, which activity I want to host. Like I can plan like a couple of rounds in advance, right? But when I was playing a board game arena, I just could not do that. Like I find it really hard for me to strategize and like come up with like a good like plan for me to like execute when I'm playing on a computer. I just, I don't know if it's just the medium or what it is. And I wanna know if that, you know, happens to any of you. Like, do you find it harder for one to learn games on Board Game Arena for the first time? Like just reading the rules and learning a new game. And then if it's a game you actually already know, do you find it harder to actually formulate a strategy and execute that strategy while playing on Board Game Arena? I feel like the medium makes it more difficult for me and I don't know why that is. Um, I just find it much easier to like come up with a plan and execute a strategy when the game is actually physically before me. So I don't know why that is, but that's the case for me. And I was curious if that's the case for you as well. So of course this question only applies if you play games on Board Game Arena, Tabletop Simulator, or Tabletopia, or some other similar website that has board games for you to play online. So I guess that is it. So I have a couple of one minute videos that I will be making in the next few weeks. Uh, so just to give you a little preview, I guess I can tell you what's coming up. So again, Tolerance is coming up. Um, the game I showed you last week, Cursed Goblins, Passengers, um, and then Fractured Sky, which is a new game from Ivy Games, which is launching on Kickstarter next month. So I have that on its way to me. So that will be coming up soon in April and then Pioneer Rails. So those are the games that are coming up for one minute overview videos or two minutes, uh, depending on how much time they need. So I guess until next week, bye.